Welcome to the Coach You Show, where we learn directly from Dennis Yu and special guests. So you guys know in our weekly Coach You Show, Thursday, 5 p.m. Pacific, we have a new topic each week, and I'll lay out the initial framework and then see what you guys think, because we've got a lot of experts that join us, which is super cool. Like we have Lisa Beyer, who let's bring up and make a moderator, and some other folks too. I think Daniel Vega might be coming to join us. So if you see him pop up, let's make him a moderator. Today, we're going to talk about how it's time to publish. And a lot of you guys, including me, have wanted to publish a book or do a podcast or build a course or create some form of long form content. And for various reasons, we haven't done it because we're not ready, because next week is better, because we think it's too expensive, because there's lots of tools, because all these other kinds of things. But I want to share with you today a technique, a few techniques that have worked super well for me and other friends that I think will help get you over the hump. And it's not motivation. It's not like, oh, I'm going to put my goal of writing a book or a podcast or course or whatever as my screensaver so it reminds me every time on my phone unlock. No, it's about, how, it's literally this simple. I'm going to give you a little summary. Then I want to ask you guys for feedback and Lisa and I as moderators will answer your questions and other experts that are here. It's this, you have not just one book, you have many books inside your head. And when I interviewed Chandler Bolt, who's the CEO of self publishing school, you know, we, we agree on the same kind of thing. It's this, you sit down for an hour and record a one hour video most people, they peter out after about 45 minutes for some reason. But, you know, go for an hour against 10 bullet points that are five minutes each. That gives you enough time to do an introduction and a conclusion, a little bit of time for maybe taking a little break in between or whatnot. But in that one hour, if you've got some clear bullet points around a particular topic, you can write a book. Because any of our friends that are authors here, whether it's ghost written or we do it the old fashioned way, or I'm a video first kind of guy. What you do is you just have to be the star and you make that video. And then you can, you can have a team. I call this the content factory that takes that video, transcribes it. We happen to like to use dscript.com, which includes overdub and builds built in transcription I mean, you could certainly use auto.ai integrated with frame.io. You could run it straight through rev.com. There's other kinds of transcription tools, but whatever it is, that video that we like to store it in Google Drive and back it up inside Dropbox and a couple other places, that video then gets processed by someone on Fiverr, VAs on your team, someone on Upwork, you know, whatever it is, and they can run it through I'm, I'm listing a whole bunch of tools. So you guys are going to want to write this down. If you're listening, you're going to write, write this down because I've spent a lot of time messing around with all these different tools to figure out how they work together. You're going to run it through this tool called Design R. D-E-S-I-G-N-R-R. -R. Like these weird tech companies, they name things, they miss letters or whatever. And it automatically turns the thing into a book with the transcription including all the different videos. Now you'll see that it'll say, oh, it's only $37 for a lifetime license. But by the time you buy the other stuff that you need, you're basically paying like 150, 200 bucks. So that's just kind of how it is. And you choose a cover, you get some testimonials, you build a landing page, you post it to YouTube, you know, all that kind of stuff. But now you've taken a one hour video of you talking about different topics. It could be a podcast where you interview somebody and you have a legit ebook of 40 some pages. We find that one minute of solid content with some images and other kinds of fluff and things like that in a small format yields about one page in a book. So a one hour podcast or course or whatever it is, we can turn into an ebook. So having an ebook is not enough by itself because, you know, a lot of people publish ebooks. A lot of people have a podcast. It's really sad because you see them on YouTube or iTunes or whatever it is and they have no views, no downloads. So then you take it and you publish it to free-ebooks.net, which you can publish for free as long as it meets certain kinds of criteria there. 
And that will give you some significant exposure because that site gets a million visitors a month, plus has a list of 5 million people highlighting the best books in whatever category. I'm assuming that all of us here, we're doing nonfiction, but it could just as easily be romance or thriller or sci-fi or erotic. I don't think anyone here is going to write an erotic book, but that's a pretty big category. It's like 30% of all the content on the internet, believe it or not. So then you, that, that's the process, right? You produce that content where you only have to do 5% of the work and the other 95% is run through this content factory. The content factory could be your own people. If you're producing a ton of these, we've built 80 courses, eight zero, not 18 for ourselves and other friends. So we have a bunch of in-house video editors and content people and WordPress people and folks are building landing pages and dedicated sorts of people. But if you have not done your first one yet, you could run the whole thing just through Fiverr or Upwork. I think the process should, depending on how many extras and whatnot, should cost you $350 to $500 for the production of it, the marketing of it, putting it on landing pages. Because if you create content and no one sees it, what's the point, right? I mean, you could technically produce your ebook for like 10 bucks. It's literally, you just take that video file, you transcribe it, cost you about seven cents a minute for most transcriptions that are automatic. Like a rev.com will charge you a buck a minute where it's human transcription. I, I don't want to do that unless it's really important or I got money to burn. But you could, you could technically get it out there for 10 or $15 and run it through these different tools. But what we find, and Lisa, Lisa feel free to chime in, that the production of the book, especially for people that are new, like they're new authors or they're new course builders, they think like, oh, I worked so hard and yeah, I'm done with my book now. Mm, no, it's three times the effort to promote and market the thing, right? I know Jeffrey and Lisa and other folks, you guys, you guys know this. I know Thomas has got his book, Thomas and the Orange, just like me, Thomas Haw, you can see right below me. He's got his book coming out. It's still kind of in gestation. We'll say it's like the first trimester, right? But once you get the book out, don't think, oh, it's time to celebrate and we're done. I mean, you can celebrate, but just know that that is only a third of the way there because it's three times the effort to promote it. Why? Because from that book, you have to post it on different areas. You want to then publish it on Amazon. So KDP or whatever you want to choose, right? Kindle Direct Publishing. Amazon will help you get it up there. You get an ISBN number, which costs you a couple dollars, like nothing. You get friends to buy the book you have you know you release the ebook version for free or for you know a dollar to bump up sales during your pre-launch if you do a jeff walker plf formula then you know you get more reviews the more reviews you get the more you move up in the amazon rankings if you choose the right category you know that's for the book side if you look at the course side it's the same thing you record that one hour video provided you have a good outline and that outline is around the achievement of a goal not just like you know how do you have a great relationship with your spouse. Okay, whatever. There's a lot of stuff out there on that. A lot of people talking about that on podcasts, but if you want to turn to a course, it's 90 days to re romance repair or something like that by Dr. Kim Grimes or something like that. Some kind of program, some kind of achievement of a result through 12 steps. A lot of people like to choose 12 step programs for whatever, or however many steps. And you talk to that framework and people understand there's the value, you know, what would a what would a happy wife, happy life look like? Would that be worth $500 to you? And you get a live one-on-one -on -one coaching call with Lisa Beyer or Dr. Kim Grimes or whoever it might be. Yeah, okay, then I can see that how that could be a course, right? Same thing, one hour video, break it in different components and you you can still create the ebook version as kind of like the textbook guide, but then you're gonna take those chapters and you're gonna upload it to your Kajabi or Thinkific or LearnDash, which is my favorite. I'm having dinner with Justin Fairman, the CEO of LearnDash, founder of LearnDash. So I am a little biased because I really like their software. If you have WordPress and you want to host it yourself and integrate with your Infusionsoft or MailChimp or HubSpot or whatever your email landing page shopping cart system is. And then you've got a course that people can log in. They can pay. It has chapters and lessons and exercises and quizzes and those kinds of things. You can have multiple authors, right? Same kind of thing. You're taking this one hour long form piece of content chopping it up into pieces and putting it in the course format. And some people will say, I really like Thinkific more than Kajabi, more than ClickFunnels, or you can sort of build courses on ClickFunnels. Don't do it. I, it technically you can, but I, I don't like it, okay? It doesn't have an API. You don't have analytics. You can't run ads against it. It doesn't integrate with email. 
all kinds of things. Now, let's say you have a podcast, right? This is the other kind of long form content. And you have all these friends that you want to interview. And I'd love to interview Jeffrey on paw.com and how he grew the thing. And I don't want to reveal the revenue numbers that he told me, but they're very impressive unless they're public and we can talk about it, right? And all, now let's say there's other people you want to interview around a particular topic that you want to be known for. In this case, I'm coach you and I'm interviewing other entrepreneurs and they're sharing their secrets how to do something step by step, right? Like what we're doing here, talking about how to actually do the thing. Then I can take those podcast episodes and I can turn them into courses. I can run them through, if I'm lazy, I can run them through a fireside.fm or what is it? Not Podbooker, Pod, Poditize. So all these other services, you pay like 100, 150 bucks per episode. They'll do all the production. They'll publish it. They'll handle basic sorts of marketing, which is back to the same thing. You're doing 5% of the work, which is recording the content, and then the machine takes over, right? This content factory, you're leveraging. You can mix and match. So you could mix and match from Fiverr, from Fancy Hands, from Upwork, from the unemployed girl next door who was trying to be a social media marketer, right? But either way, there's a whole process around the, the production and editing and distribution and amplification and analysis and whatever around the content. And I see this for everyone here. This, this is, if you're listening, if you're a human being and you're listening or reading or watching this, then you know that the, the production of the content is not the issue. Like you having the expertise and the experience is not the issue. It's all these other pieces that people fall down on because they end up, they as the author, the talent or whatever, try tries to do the whole thing themselves. Like can you imagine Tom Cruise, you know, he's the actor and he does his thing, right? He produces the content by running and screaming and jumping on couches in front of Oprah, whatever he does. But then he has to do the filming. He has to do the editing. He has to cut the reels up and distribute it to the studios and negotiate royalty rights and merchandise rights and things like that. It just, it wouldn't work, right? There's too many things. So I want to encourage you. I'm going to open up to thoughts and questions in just a minute. There's a hand raised button in the bottom left. Press it in a second. What is it that you want to get out there? And if you knew that the whole gargantuan effort of publishing that book or course or podcast or whatever it is, the website, some, some big daunting thing is causing you to not do it. And so you've just been stuck in this, uh, can't, I'll get around to doing, I don't have any money. I, this is going to be really expensive. You could do it for a couple hundred bucks, right? Hopefully that's not a lot of money. If you're, you have a business, right? You're selling a product or service. You should, you should be able to cover that out of your earnings, right? Your marketing, you should reinvest 15, 20% of your gross revenue back in the marketing, something like that, right? You should be able to do this. So I'd love to hear from you guys. What do you think about this? What would you, if there was no risk of failure, if you could get this whole system working, which you can, because you can use our templates and you can follow other people here who are doing the same thing. What, what would you have your book course or podcast on? And if you do have your book por course or podcast, what is it on and how is it performing? Are you getting traffic on it? Maybe it's a book and you can turn the book into a course. Why not, right? You just literally read the thing in front of a computer. Well, no, don't read the thing. That's boring, right? Make it interesting. Turn it into a video. You already have the outline. You have your course? Great. Turn it into a book. You have a podcast? Good. Take each of those podcast episodes, the ones that fit, not some wandering discussion because that's really hard. You need to have an outline. That's really hard to turn into a book. But take key podcast episodes where you have some, you've interviewed someone on how to do something and they say it's one, two, three, four, five. Here's the recipe and turn that into the, the book or a course, but you see how a course and a podcast and a book are all kind of the same thing. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I want to see what do you guys think? I really think there's an amazing opportunity here for all of us. It costs almost nothing. It wasn't until the last six months that these tools became available that do these crazy AI things like pulling in Jarvis. I'm playing golf tomorrow with Dave Roganmesser who created Jarvis, which used to be called Converge.ai, which is built on GPT-3, that AI that writes so convincingly that writes better than we can it can write in the tone of whoever's voice we want but now is the time i i predict that in the next three years lisa feel free to chime in we're going to have an explosion of everyone publishing their books the book is the new business card and i think that we here today in clubhouse are going to contribute to more turds in the punch bowl 
more yeah. people putting their books out there. Dennis, ahead, if I, if, yeah, if I had to say my one regret when I wrote my book is that I did not do my course from the book sooner. So, I mean, that's definitely like a huge lesson and something to make sure that if you are doing a course, make sure you turn it into a book and vice versa. But one thing I just want to like level up to what you said about repurposing and the book, the podcast, the course are really all kind of the same thing. Um, one thing that Hustle and Flowchart do, the guys, uh, Matt and Joe, is they turn their podcast episodes into a monthly like old school newsletter that people can subscribe to and you actually get it in the mail. And it's, it's like a, almost like, like not a magazine format, but like an old school newsletter, but like what you would picture an ebook to look like, but printed and nice on nice paper. And so I just think that's brilliant to get something that nobody really is doing anymore. Some, a physical type of old school piece of marketing to add that to your repurposing. Amen. And for those of you that don't know Lisa Beyer, who's up in the top, right? Lisa and I go back how many years? Like 12, four, I mean, many years. Yeah, more than 12. <laughs> a lot. Anyway, she's she's young. She started internet marketing when she was, you know, five. Look at her. She's so young. <laughs> and she's one of the most successful digital agencies out there. And she also teaches, which is really key. University of Florida. I've taught, guest lectured at her classes a few times. She is one. We are so lucky to have her. She's one of the top minds when it comes to PR and social media. Not because she has the books. Not because she's done it for a long time, but because she actually has run an agency and taught other people how, how to do it and put together courses and books and mentored other young adults like I have to be able to do the same thing. So you guys and should definitely give her a follow. Thanks, Dennis. But what I'm doing now is I basically said goodbye. I quit to all of my agency clients and the agency model. And now I'm dedicating my business model to basically publishing and, and creating content like courses and books and training. So, you know, it, it's possible to do both or one or the other, but I've now picked this new route and I'm super excited about it and to talk about it tonight. Lisa can do that because she has the experience to back it up, to talk about it. So this is not the 20 year old life coach giving advice on how to be happy, healthy, wealthy. Lisa has a ton of experience. I'm not calling you or I old Lisa, which she can start launching courses and programs and books and all that around it because she has the frame of reference, she has the network, and she has the step-by-step -step experience and the case studies and all that to be able to talk about this. So for those of you that have, if you follow the 10,000 hour rule, a good amount of experience in a particular field, feel free to start thinking about how you expand by teaching. And I was kind of like Lisa where I thought, I don't know if I want to start promoting myself because I don't want to be a Gary Vaynerchuk, Tony Robbins, self-promoting kind of person. And there's other people that know more than me about these other topics. And I just don't want to be that guy. But I believe now it is fundamental to marketing and sales that you have to put something out there to show that you know how to do A, B, and C. And it also helps with things like customer onboarding because they understand here's what you do and what you don't do. It creates a recipe that other people can follow. So your book is kind of a franchisable model. And but it also creates like a, like, a, like a paper trail, like a credibility trail. So to keep those things coming out mo monthly or quarterly, whether it's an ebook or a course, it's showing like if you look back in history that you've kept up with whatever your industry is, you're, you're, you're relevant, you're not, you know, somebody, somebody that wrote something five years ago or 10 years ago. And depending on the industry, it, it maybe it is or isn't relevant, but keep going, keep doing new stuff every year, every quarter, at least. And that way you have this, this historical kind of credibility trail and that's your your brand awareness and your brand credibility and your brand authority now i want to give you guys some hacks or cheats which i think are still white hat you could call them gray hat you tell me that will help you accelerate this one mark cuban you know owner of the mavericks and sold his stuff at yahoo a long time he would give these speeches or talks or whatnot or be on different radio shows and have those turned into blog articles on blog Maverick, which is great. That's an example of repurposing. But then he took the blog post that he wrote over the last, whatever, few years, and then he published that into a book. He didn't create any additional content. It wasn't like he wrote a new introduction. It wasn't like there's additional chapters. Literally the things that are already online for free on his blog, he shamelessly 
turned it into a book on Amazon and became a bestseller because it's Mark Cuban. Wow. I have some other friends. I'm not going to name them because I think this is going too far where they have literally taken their Facebook posts from the last 365 days. And those are 365 chapters. And then this, this guy's a motivational bro-preneur, be an entrepreneur. You can do it. Tattoos kind of guy. And he published that as a book and started marketing the book. And the book then became kind of a bumper sticker or fan loyalty mark. You know, if you're a fan of a band, you might buy the T-shirt or whatever just to kind of show support, to show that you're a member, right? This is like your member carrying card, NRA rifle kind of thing. And that's what he did. He had a lot of people buy this book. It became an Amazon bestseller in some subcategory that he chose that didn't have any competition. But it's an example of repurposing content. The idea that the content starts with you. The best way is you on video, just like Coach You, Why You with no O in it. And then that can be repurposed into the longer, you know, longer form content can be repurposed into books, podcasts, courses like we talked about. But you can chop it up and turn it into tweets and stories and Instagram reels and YouTubes, just like Lisa talked about with Joe and uh, Joe Fire and who's the other guy? Matt. Matt, Matt. Yeah, Matt. Matt and Joe. Man, I get them confused because there's so many of these these tag team duo interview folks out there, and you can you can cross purpose. We've done this every week. We have this thing called Office Hours, where we talk about a topic like how do you use Tolstoy to build an interactive video? How do you write a book by just starting with an outline and using Jarvis Day Ad to write out the rest of it? How do you hire your first VA? How do you build a click funnel site how do you do a dollar a day video how do you you know how do you do these things recipe driven one two three four five and every one of those even though it's part of our office hour subscription where people can netflix their way there which is a hundred dollars a month to get access to everything we have but people can come in and buy any individual episode for seven dollars see so imagine you take all the content that you have and everything turns into an episode or a podcast now i'm going to give you a real lazy tip which I think everyone should do. We record client meetings, all of them, in Zoom. And the clients understand that we're recording and it's good for other people that didn't make the meeting just in case they want to know because we're going to take notes, right? So they, I've never seen a client say no. They always say yes. But and now Zoom has this thing that pops up that says, oh, this meeting's being recorded. Are you okay? Yes, okay. And all of the people on our team, they could be VAs or account managers, they are recording what they're doing via Loom. So, you know, Facebook has this new conversion API that tracks conversions because of the iOS 14 thing. And so we've documented how that works. We've documented how Google, my business, does call tracking, this new tab inside your GMB that shows you all these cool analytics, like who called and where they're from and all this. Like, wow, that's really cool. How do you get that? Oh, you got to turn it on and you have to do this other thing over here and then integrate your Google analytics with your GMB and auto tag your Google ads. How do you do that? Well, one, two, three, four, five. And so we're, every time we do something, we record that on Loom. So we have client meetings we're recording in Zoom. We have step-by-step -step stuff that our people are doing, ideally already off the menu, but if it's not on the menu, then they need to record it because everything needs to be on the menu so other people can watch the little Loom things. And then we have a team of people, and all they do is cut these things up into lessons and courses that sit inside our library, which we call the task library. There's a thousand tasks that are in there, which – we can rearrange the combinations of these ingredients and publish books on whatever topic that we want just because there's, you know, a, a burrito, taco, tostada, tostada, enchilada, chalupa, you know, chimichanga. Those are all meat, beans, cheese, rice, whatever, just recombined. Same ingredients recombined into other formats. When you have all these ingredients, you can recombine them in different ways, which I think that's the ultimate end of repurposing. Most people think of repurposing as, all right, I'll just chop this thing in the tweets and Instagram, or I'll cross post from Instagram to Facebook and Twitter because it's already built in. But the ultimate end of repurposing is you can make any combination of things off of the raw material, like a Mexican or Chinese restaurant. That's called a Chinese menu analogy. But because of AI, like Jarvis.ai, Synthesia.io, and other tools that AI their way into creating content that you never actually said or spoke or your face or whatnot, that creates all these new possibilities, which are very minority report, brave new world, enemy of the state, Skynet, scary. You know, you can black mirror your way into whatever you want. I think that it's both good and bad. You know, Elon Musk thinks this is the biggest evil that is ever going to come, whatever, right? I don't know if I believe him. I think he's a 
I think he's like a technical Donald Trump just trying to get attention. But either way, this is where things are going. And I'd love to hear from you guys, the audience, what do you think about this? Hit the hand raise button in the bottom to let us know what, like contribute your, your thought. What are you going to do based on this? Uh, Dennis, while we're waiting Jeffrey's for Armand. while we're waiting for people to raise their hands, I'll just share some of my own experience with this. And if you're if you're thinking about what could you write about, what could your book be, think about what presentations you've given. Um, my book started as a five minute presentation I gave at a Ford event with Scott Monty. I had to give a five minute um, presentation where where I had to use twenty slides, and every slide advanced every fifteen seconds without my control and you had to plan it that way. And I got such a good reaction to that particular presentation on that topic that I said, you know, I could turn this into a book. And five years later, that's exactly what I did. I turned the five minute presentation into an actual book. And now I do an hour long presentation based on the book. So it went full circle from a five minute presentation to a 150 page book to an hour long presentation all on the same topic. So I think this repurposing is great. And the other thing I want to give a, an unpaid plug for is Descript, Dennis, which you mentioned, because I use it quite frequently. And this is a game changer. I started my career in the entertainment industry, so I learned how to edit video back on three-quarter inch Umatic machines, you know, back in the 80s. Um, so old school editing. And so a lot of people are turned off by producing a lot of video because they think the editing is going to be complicated and hard. And what Descript does is if you upload video that you've shot – it will automatically transcribe it, and then you can edit the video by editing the text. So think about that. You don't have to move the shots and put the shots together. If you want something to say, say it right, you literally edit the text like you would edit a Word file, and then it automatically conforms the video to the text you've edited. And you can also remove ums and ahs very easily, and it's just an unbelievably powerful tool to edit video, to clean up your video, or edit audio for that matter. So I'm a big fan. Again, I have no connection to it. This is not a, a, an affiliate situation. I just think it's a great tool. I pay for it, and I use it almost every day. I third that, Jeffrey. I have to say, like, people can't even understand if they haven't used it, how simple it is and how, like, it's like magic. So I, I say everybody should check it out, even if you're not repurposing. Uh, I mean, it just makes your life so much easier in so many ways when it comes to writing and editing for from different audio and video. This is something that everyone, let's go a little bit deeper to what Jeffrey and Lisa said. I'm going to tell you a couple things that I think you'll find shocking enough to go investigate yourself. And then I want to introduce Danny Vega, who is right below Jeffrey there. We're going to have some Brazilian barbecue here in San Antonio in about half an hour, I don't know, a little bit more than that. So Descript, which Jeffrey mentioned, started maybe four years ago for people who had podcasts, which is mainly audio. And so you'd import the audio files and then you could move things around and clean them up and you'd edit the audio files just like you edit a Word document. So all that crazy cutting of ums and ahs and dead space and filtering noise and all the balancing that's necessary, you know, the audio remastering and video mastering, which occurs a little bit later. That's what Descript did. It was great for podcasters. But then they said, you know what? Most podcasters are recording with video now too. There are some old school people that still do audio only, but really, even if it's for audio distribution on podcasts, you still want the video component, right? So then they said, all right, well, we'll import the video. So now you can edit your video just like you're editing a Word document. So on one screen, you have all the words and you edit that. It edits the video at the same time. It takes out filler words. And then they added a feature about a year ago called Overdub. Overdub is this deep fake AI thing where once it learns your voice, and there's certain requirements around getting permission to let Overdub use this voice. Otherwise, you get all these fake Donald Trumps and, you know, whatnots, people trying to fool you. And whatnot. and they've loosened the requirements on setting up new voices and the cost. It used to be only be in the Enterprise Edition, and now they've made it cheaper. We paid a lot of money to get early access to it to a year ago. But here's what Overdub does. You have the words that are showing up on the left side, and then below, depending on how you organize it, you have the actual audio and video files. Once it learns your voice then you can mouse over a section of text and just have it say something in your voice or someone else's voice that you didn't say. And it's absolutely scary because if it's just a short snippet, like a couple words, like we could say, oh, today's September 25th. Let's say that's what actually was said. And then we hit the overdub thing and we overwrite it and say, oh, it's, it's actually September 26th. It's actually 
May 3rd. It's that, you know, hey, greetings, Jeffrey Sass. How are you doing? Because <laughs> the, the risk is it'll sound like, hey, Jeffrey Sass, how are you doing on a Thursday afternoon? <laughs> and I noticed that you are in San Diego, California. See, it'll, that's how most of this stuff sounds. But they've gotten so smart, they've built in intonations. Now, if you try to put a whole sentence inside Overdub, it's going it, to, if you're listening, you can tell that the robot made it in your voice. It's like not quite right. But if you're not really paying attention, you're not going to notice that the robot is just like, if you change words within a sentence, then it can figure out contextually what has to happen. And now with Overdub, it's initially you come in and there's these scripts that are like one minute or not one minute, it's like five minutes long, 15 minutes long, an hour long. And so the more you teach it, the more of this, you know, uh, what, what is the, the quick brown fox jumped over to the lazy dog? Like whatever you read their script saying all these different words and the way they want you to say them, the more it learns. So if you take the full 60 minute thing and you record it through high quality audio, it's scary what it can do. And what we want to do is not just use it for courses, books and programs, and whatever. But now if we have an infinite Lisa buyer, as many Lisa buyers or Danny Vegas as we want, then we can have Lisa say, Hey, Danny, uh, you know, I was looking at your tweets and I noticed that you said this one thing about such and such. And I thought maybe, you know, you'd like to find out about my course. And in chapter four, I talk about such and such. In fact, I'd love to get a quote from you on this one thing in my book, my new course that's coming out or whatnot. So we can, if we combine overdub that's in Descript, which is taking words and turning them into audio that isn't real, but sounds real. And we use Jarvis.ai, which used to be called Conversion.ai. We can have the bot not only write words we didn't say, but also say them convincingly in the voice that we choose. Okay. Then there's another one called Synthesia.io. And you can choose, like it was made initially for video game designers. We'd have characters that would say like, you know, great kill or 500 points or like whatever it is, you know, these characters would say things inside the game, like inside an NBA game or football game where you have John Madden say something like, yeah, that was a great touchdown, you know, whatever it is. Cause you don't want that person having to try to say all those phrases and say all the names of the players. Like you just have the AI do it. Right. But Synthesia does the face. So Descript only does the, in terms of overdub only does the audio overdub. So it, it fakes the voice, but you can't fake the lips. So what we did prior to Synthesia and these other tools is when it came to faking the audio, we would switch to B-roll. We would switch to something else before switching back to their face because we couldn't do their lips. But now Synthesia, they started, right, just like the Descript started with podcasters or started in this one thing with media and entertainment. They were for video game figures where like the little girl in the bottom corner saying, congratulations on building your castle. Now it's time, you know, the... Oh, my overlord, the barbarians are attacking you now. Time to fortify your, you know, whatever. You know how, like in the game, like the, the character tells you, like the guide like tells you what to do. So they would have these different characters, right? But now you can create your own character. Upload your face. Of course, just like with Descript, upload it as with the highest resolution, filmed well, different angles. So that way it kind of, it looks natural because as you turn your face and as you make different expressions, it'll kind of go along with it. And... The, the fake audio and fake video is absolutely crazy. If you look at who, who is the one, it's ancestry.com, right? So if you upload, this is uncanny, you upload just a single picture of your great, great, great grandmother or whatever in black and white or somebody who fought in World War I or what, you upload this picture, it will animate that picture in a way that looks really kind of eerily lifelike just off of a picture. Dennis, there was a really interesting yeah. um, case around this, not a case, but just an example, because this kind of technology is now, you know, weaving its way into mainstream entertainment. So Anthony Bourdain, as we know, is, is sadly passed away. So he's dead. There's a documentary that just came out um, about him, and it, it was very controversial because there's a scene in the documentary where they used the technologies that you're talking about to have Anthony Bourdain say something that he never actually said. They had no recording of him saying it. Now, he wrote it, so they took a quote. They took something that he wrote, but they had him saying it, and there were no existing, before his death, uh, existing recordings of him ever saying those words. Um, but in the documentary, he says them in his voice, 
and it was very controversial and it got a lot of publicity for the documentary. But we're going to see more and more and more of this. Or maybe we won't see it because we won't even know it's happening. We'll just watch stuff and think it's normal. Yeah. So I don't want to dive down that rabbit hole because that's a whole nother episode by itself of AI and the evil things that could happen in Black Mirror. The reason why we're talking about this is to show you that if you want to get your book or course or blog post or podcast or whatever thing of content that seems daunting to you because you don't have the time to write all this stuff and record it and edit it and publish it and whatnot. This is where you need these AI tools. Look, just like technology, you, you, can, you, you can't say that nuclear power is bad. I mean, you could blow up you know, a city with nuclear power, but you could also power a city. I mean, you know, fire can cook a steak and fire can burn your hand. So no, it's not like this AI stuff is good or bad. It's just how you use it. The next guest I want to bring up, I believe, is one of the world's foremost experts in using this tool called Jarvis.ai and being able to write this kind of content. So if you have an outline, you can turn that outline into a book by just having the tool generate, generate, generate. just keep hitting the button and it'll generate this thing. Of course, you need to guide the thing because the robot's only as smart as the direction you tell it. But this is, I think, the, the easiest way to assist what you already have. If you start with the seed, just like, you know, on Facebook ads, the, a, a custom audience turns into a lookalike audience. This is what these AI tools are doing. So I'd love to introduce Danny Vega, and he can talk about things that he's doing to produce long-form content. So all you guys, when you want to get your book or course or video or whatnot, how do we use the AI to do things in a non-deceitful way to share our expertise, share our knowledge, make us look good, but not cheat the system, if that makes sense? Hey, Danny, you there? I am, Dennis. Thanks for bringing me on. Tell everybody how awesome you are. <laughs> no, it's the opposite of how awesome you are, Dennis. <laughs> now, I was just sitting here listening to some of these tools that I've never heard of myself. And I've been, I've been you know, in, in marketing and business for almost 15 years now. And uh, I was just trying to Google as much stuff as I could, just like everyone else was. <laughs> it's because they're new, because they haven't been around very long. Right. I'd love for you to tell everyone about long form content using Jarvis and some quick tips and tricks and maybe like what it is for people that have never heard of it, because these tools have all popped up in the last year because this right. AI thing has just gone crazy. It's just gone vertical, really. Yeah. So if you guys haven't heard of Jarvis, Jarvis is an AI tool that helps you write content. I mean, that's that's the simplest form, um, you know, with with anything AI, especially when it comes to content, um, we do a lot of content for. Uh, a lot of the local businesses that we help in, in, as far as our agency goes, <clears throat> we do a lot of SEO for them. And so far to date, we've um, we've just done just under 10 million words since I think since we really started using it, which was back in March, which was when uh, we really started diving in and getting familiar with Jarvis. Um, but uh, it, it's the 80 20 rule. You know, we, we have Jarvis do 80 percent of the content, the curating. Uh, if you don't know how that works, Jarvis, you know, uses GPT-3, which is a technology. It's downloaded, you know, anything that's public domain on the Internet, I think, as of 2019. So most of anything that you're looking for, it's going to be able to pull, whether it's from a website, PDF files, um, <clears throat> again, anything that's that's publicly uh, readable online. And, you know, as you're typing information in there, it starts to look at your, you know, like the past, let's say, for example, 2000 characters of what you typed. And it just starts piecing things together in order to make a coherent sentence that, for the most part, uh, is pretty well written. Um, now, with AI, you know, it's not always going to be factually correct. That's why I said the 80-20 rule. You know, 80% is Jarvis curating the content. The other 20% is really up to you as the individual to make sure that, you know, it's factually correct and it's grammarly, you know, all the punctuations there are all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, just the, the post editing really is, is, um, is where you, you would spend most of your time. Um, but you know, it, it helps a lot. And, um, I mean, if, if it wasn't for Jarvis, you know, I, I've, I've had my agency for, for over 15 years, just off and on for the most part. And we've never been able to write as much content as we have in the last, just, you know, five months now. Uh, so it's been a huge game changer. And I'm super excited to see where AI in general is going in the next year or two. Uh, if content is being able to be, you know, produced using AI technology, 
I'm sure in the next coming you know year, we're also going to get that with images as well. What do you think about that, Dennis? It's already there, but people aren't talking about it because it's causing consumers to distrust content that they see because they know that. Did, did you see Adobe release something seven years ago and they called it Photoshop for audio? Now, because a lot of people would say, oh, that thing's Photoshop, just like in the movie studios. Well, you can Photoshop audio and they showed how they could do that to get people to say things that they didn't say. And now you can Photoshop video and you have, you know, Tom Cruise on TikTok and these kinds of deep fakes. Did you know that nearly all of the sports recaps and a lot of news like, oh, so and so, so and so team played so and so. And in the third inning, this happened. And then so and so scored. And wow, it was, you know, this is now so, you know, all these, like, it looks like it was written by a human. The majority of that is written by AI because it just doesn't make sense. And we've seen studies where the, here's one that was written by an actual journalist on that basketball game or whatever. And here's one written by the AI. And we can't tell which one was written by who. We can't tell. And like Danny was saying, with Jarvis, you can have it right in the tone of voice of someone who is, as long as they're significant enough to have stuff on the internet about them, it will impersonate. So write, you know, whatever. Why I think that money is fictional in the tone of voice of Grant Cardone and turn it into a blog post and give me 10 different headlines that I can choose and generate a blog outline of 10 different chapters. Now fill in each of those chapters with the story. And make sure it includes these particular keywords because we're trying to sell this particular financial product. So if you give the AI those guidelines on where you're trying to go, on the keywords you're trying to insert, the tone of voice, it can be happy or excited, sad, anxious, witty. It can be a person. Then the AI just goes to work. And I've seen hundreds of my friends use this tool, mainly in like April, May. Like it's really started to pick up. And they are writing great content. Now, some people are failing at it because they don't know how to train the robot. They don't know how to give the robot the right directions. So they, they just say, write a piece about digital marketing. All right, you need to be a little more specific, like what aspect of digital marketing? Digital marketing for who? What are you trying to sell? Are you using the IDA framework? Are you trying to get people to buy a particular, like you need, you gotta give the thing a little bit more direction. So guys, I would encourage you, check it out. You know, like Lisa and Danny were saying, there's lots of these tools, like you could, Spend so much time just looking at Jarvis Data AI, which does have a free trial. I think if you use my link or Danny's link, you get a free trial. Then we earn like a dollar or two, whatever it is. And Descript, I don't know if they have a free trial, but it's pretty cheap if you go on their, their cheapest version. But if you go to those two and just start playing around, you're going to get caught up in this trap. And like, dang it, Dennis and Jeff and Lisa and Danny told me about this tool. And I've lost a whole evening because I've just explored it. And now my mind is blown. And I wish I would have done this 10 years ago or whatever. Right. Like Lisa said, I should, Lisa said, I should have turned my book into a course earlier. No, I think your timing is perfect, actually. But I think you guys are going to find out how limiting you have, how limited you've been limiting yourself by not publishing longer form content and getting books and podcasts and courses out there. So I believe a win for today is you guys see that there are a bunch of these tools you haven't seen. You give it a shot. See what's possible like design R or frame.io integrated with you know, the trans, you know, auto.ai or whatnot, right? There's a lot of these tools. I don't, I don't want you guys to think, oh my goodness, now he just named another 10 tools and I'm even more overwhelmed than before because I was even just trying to make one minute videos on Facebook, which is what he talked about last time. And now it's just, you know, whatever. I'm way drowning. That's not my goal. My goal is just choose one of these tools. Choose your objective. Do you want a book? You want a podcast? What is that thing? What is that piece of authority? What is, the, or maybe you're trying to improve the operations of your agency. Maybe you're a consultant. You're trying to get more clients. Maybe you're trying to, like Danny talked about, produce more content for these chiropractors. And these chiropractors can't seem to produce content, but then you don't want to auto spin using these SEO spinning tools to generate garbage. You need still good content, but they won't make it. How do you get around that? You get around it through this long form content that you produce on behalf of someone else, which it's called ghostwriting. It's not illegal. It's not unethical. Just make sure it has the initial seed of who they are, right? Hey, I'd love to open it up to some questions or some thoughts on other folks. Hey, Jeff, you want to moderate? Yeah, so we have uh, Murgesh who just joined us on stage. So do you have a comment you want to share or a question for Dennis and uh, Danny and Lisa? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, 
I am in the medical field trying to translate all the research, publish scientific research into companies and products, right? A lot of the research stays as research, does not get translated. And there's so many publications that happens, uh, particularly neurology. In the last 10 years, there are 200,000 articles that have been, uh, scientific papers that have been published, contrast to 100,000 the decade before. Uh, but it's very hard for anybody to make sense of it. So we are. I'm thinking, my question is, is there a way we can... Uh, uh, kind of synthesize these things, so layman translation, what's happening. My idea is to write a blog which basically synthesizes the last months of publication into some sort of a summary in a, that's more understandable lay person. I'm just curious to see. Uh, of course, there'll be human input. I'm just wondering if any of these tools strike you as something that's potentially helpful. Thank you. Hey, Dan, you want to take that? Talk to me like a five-year-old. Yeah, actually, and, and and actually in Jarvis, and I mean, there's there's other apps out there. Uh, I think the, I think it's called the Hemingway app, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But Jarvis also has uh, a a tool inside of it that will kind of dumb down uh, a piece of content that you gave it, like like a paragraph or you know a sentence or two, and it'll convert it depending on the type of uh, grade that you would want. Like you know. For most blog, you know, the typical blog post that does really well is like is written in a fifth grade language. Uh, obviously, for something in the medical field, you know, you want it to be a little bit more professional, but you still want it to be able to be read by by someone that would make sense. Um, so, you know, using these tools, you could definitely give it the right grade in order for it to be converted into that into that format that's going to be, you know, a little bit easier to read. Um, so hopefully that kind of helped you out. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think that answers. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Thank you. Yeah. They give it like hey, the ultimate cliff notes. Go ahead, Lisa. You know, I was going to say, Danny, I completely forgot about that um, platform Hemingway. And that's another amazing platform that um, from a writing standpoint, it's it's very rich and it's like barely ever talked about. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. It's um, let, me, let me look for it real quick. I think I think it's called Hemingway app. It, it should sure. be talked about in earnest. Ah. Yeah, Hemingwayapp.com is that site. Uh, Dennis, while you're waiting, I don't know if you're going to call up somebody else, but one thing I wanted to add to kind of the stack of repurposing using, you know, your social content. So you gave the example of taking your, maybe I thought of it when you're talking about it, but you could write one Instagram post a day and take each caption for, you know, 40 days and turn that into a book. But one thing I did with um, Digital Detox Secrets when I was writing that book and I was interviewing experts is I created a Facebook group and invited people that want, wanted to, you know, be live with me when I interviewed these experts through Facebook Live and ask questions on the topic and also grow my community and grow my audience before the book launched. I just did that you know, with that purpose in mind. And then after I published the book, I was like, okay, I could turn all these episodes into my first season of my podcast. So that's what I did is I turned all of the recorded interviews into season one of the Digital Detox Secrets podcast. And then from there, it's been sliced and diced into a million different things. But starting with the Facebook group, starting on social and then taking it off into, um, you know, into another app using AI is brilliant. That is smart. And everyone here, if you don't have a podcast and you're intimidated by other people who have hundreds of episodes, do what Lisa said. You can take content where you've already gone live, you've been interviewed, you've spoken on stage, and you can just literally, I guess, posthumously or whatever you want to call it, episodes of your podcast. Jay Abraham did the same thing. So he's been interviewed a ton of times, and he decided last year that he wanted to have a podcast. So he literally just took existing content and relabeled it as his podcast. And I find that for me, I've, there's certain things that I've just, I don't really have much to say. I need more topics. So every day I interview a couple people just for 15 minutes on how they've achieved a certain thing. And I learned so much. These are people I probably wouldn't be able to get a hold of. They're too expensive or hard to get or whatever you want to say. You can't hire them. And I'd say like, for example, yesterday I interviewed this guy, Tommy Walker uh, on how he uses how, how he automates Twitter using Data Studio and what is it, the Sheets, the Google Sheets and a couple of these tools to pull down who are the top influencers in particular topics that it's better than a lot of what these super expensive social media monitoring, tool, monitoring tools are doing and you can do it completely free. 
we had three or four tools that he mentioned and he showed me how to do it on screen step by step. It took him five minutes. And I thought, wow, this is so cool. I can turn that into a micro podcast episode. You know, podcasts don't have to be an hour. You can have five minute long podcasts, little sound bites, especially people under 30 that have no attention span. So look at what Lisa's saying. Everything is a podcast. You know, Danny and I are going to eat some Brazilian barbecue in just a few minutes. And we're going to probably pull out the phone and make a few little videos while we're eating Brazilian barbecue. Picanha is my favorite. It's the top of the top sirloin. And those we can turn into podcast episodes or little snippets. I think there's a blurring line between a podcast episode versus a story versus a Facebook post versus a LinkedIn, whatever it is. Like I, They're all just pieces of content. So my advice to you guys is publish it, publish whatever it is, because if you don't capture it, then you've lost the moment and you'll never have it. But just capture it, even if it sucks, you can throw it away. And then you can repurpose it into tweets and books and articles and stories and run it. Th- you can later polish it up. It's like black and white stuff that's turned to color, right? If you don't like colorizing, well, this is effectively what we're doing with content. We're colorizing black and white films. You can run it through a Jarvis or... Hemingway app or Descript or Overdub or Synthesia or these other sorts of tools. And I like to say you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shiitake. But if you start with your relationships, you start with little pieces of knowledge, you can actually expand it, which is like putting meat on the bone, if I use a different analogy. That's what I see with like Jarvis, right? You have a solid structure, skeleton, foundation. It'll put meat on that bone. So I Dennis, hope you guys- I think... I think the best secret that you just shared is also just going back and taking an audit of everything that you've done in the past five years. And that was actually how I um, launched Social PR Secrets, the podcast, is I went back to the, the interviews that I did for my class I taught at UF, which you were a guest on a couple times, that I did them just in private settings on, on another Facebook group. And then I did all these YouTube interviews for different things and then conference um sessions and and workshops. And I had all this video or audio content spread all over all these different platforms. And I just collected them all, went through them. I had probably 64 pieces and said, okay, these are relevant. These aren't. And I launched Social PR Secrets with 50 episodes. So my 51st episode was the new episode. 50 episodes were from just past content. Wow. You are prolific, Lisa. And I would love if we could take some of the episodes that we make and let's turn them into guest blog posts maybe on your site or my site yeah. or where I've interviewed you. Let's let's put it on episodes for you or, or you've interviewed me. Let's yeah. Know, vice versa. But the, the point is, is people might not, you might not realize that you have all this content everywhere. Like some people think in PR, I hear this all the time. Oh, we don't have any news. Like there's nothing new happening here. We don't have anything to report on. When really, once you start talking and looking into things, there there is news. So there could be this content that's like on your hard drive, on a computer, on a laptop, on YouTube, on Facebook, that you can just take an inventory and everything and you might have 10 episodes of your first podcast. My favorite Chevy dealer owner, Thomas Hawkins is here. Welcome. I just wanted Thomas. to come up and... Lisa, I just wanted to come up and make a comment about the format of the Coach You Show and the Office Hours and just encourage people. The reason that I know Dennis and now Lisa and Jeffrey is because I got connected with Dennis here and eventually got involved in this Office Hours. And if you just want to look up Office Hours and consider joining for only $100 a month, there is so much rich uh, content that is shared. And some of the things that you've talked about tonight, the conversion.ai and the, and the Descript that are talked about in these. And I've learned so much. And even though Dennis is frustrated with me because I haven't got up dead center and taken action on some things because I'm still involved in my business, I've gotten to the point now where I almost want to sell my dealership so I can get more deeply involved. There's so much content. And I, I just really appreciate what I've learned uh, being involved with Dennis and Jeffrey and you know and now I met Lisa in our office hours last week and I wanted to buy a book from her because I wanted to sign copy and she sends me her other one that uh, along with it I mean just people are so giving in this business and and uh, I just wanted to share that if anybody in the audience gets a chance to get involved with office hours it's just the connections that you make and the things that you learn and the things I learned tonight and and the approach to in the, my future book uh, is a little more crystallized in what you have to do to get to that point. I just learned so much. I wanted to share that and, and thank you guys for uh, letting me be a part of that. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. So glad you're here. You hear what Thomas just did? 
So he's in that 1% of people where they get access to a group like you guys are here. A bunch of you guys are here in, in Clubhouse in this room. And maybe you're working out and listening. Or you're, but feel free to raise your hand. The, the whole point of going to a conference or a Clubhouse, which is like the, the COVID app when there weren't conferences, is to connect with other people. On Twitter, you're just literally one tweet away from any of these other people, which means you're one tweet away. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Funnel, funnel Hacking Live is going on right now. I'll just say you're, you're one clubhouse message away, one half funnel away from building that connection that leads to other connections, that leads to something you didn't even know that you needed. And if there's something that you need, some business need that you have, some connection you need to make when you're in the right group, like think about the, the level of the, the, the connection power and knowledge power that Danny here has with the 15-year agency the owner and Lisa's been doing it for 30-some and Jeffrey and I are both dinosaurs, right? <laughs> think, think of the level of connection and knowledge that you have here. But if you never raise your hand, you're never going to, you know, it's like the butterfly beats its wings. It's never going to, you got to build that connection. You got to be like Thomas and you got to reach out. I wish, I wish there, you know, I was more like Thomas 20 years ago because I saw these other people speaking on stage like, ah, I'm just going to listen. But this is an incredible, you know, look, at, look on your phone, that bottom there, that little hand raise button. You could hit that button and say something right now. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, there we go. Hit that button and say something. Go ahead. Just let let let's let people up. Let's say something. Hi, uh, I actually had a question. It's probably like a very basic for you guys. I mean, I've learned so much just by listening to you all, and I'm grateful for everything that you've said. But may I ask that question? Is this the right form? Um, yeah. A ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So the question I have is like, um, is just like, uh, you know, basic keyword discovery, like, uh, you know, Google has a section for keywords and, uh, I only have one or two show up. I have 10,000 hits a day on my webpage and how do I discover, you know, what my keywords are and what my keywords should be? Um, yeah. Are you using Google search console? Um, yes, I am. Okay. And what do you see in terms of not provided? in analytics versus what you see in GSC? I think I need to look at it to, to see, but it's, yeah. it's, never, it's never super detailed. SEMrush has the largest index now of all the SEO tools that have been competing. I used to like Ahrefs or Majestic and way back in the day, Moz is my favorite, but SEMrush now has a real-time index that will unlock all those keywords way deeper than what Google's gonna show you. Google's so privacy conscious, they're only gonna show it to you on the PPC side of things. Then there used to be something called the Google Wonder Wheel which is amazing, but they took it away. So now the closest you can get to latent semantic indexing, which is LSI, which is all the different themes, is you can use tools like Answer the Public. So if you go to Answer the Public and you look on a topic, you'll see these related sorts of topics, which help you do a lot of this keyword research. You can also use SpyFu. There's a tool within spyfu.com, founded by my friend Mike Roberts, called Combat, spelled with a K. And it'll show you the intersection of what keywords you are using paid and organic versus what your competitors are doing. Does that help you out, my friend? Oh, awesome. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you so much, Dennis. I enjoy being part of your community. I'm glad you're here, Samya. You see, Samya got some free help here by merely asking. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> thank you, Samya. Hey, how about Rex Williams? How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I <laughs> never back down from a a challenge to speak up <laughs> so yeah welcome my friend what's up um well it's great discussion uh yeah i've been uh i've been following a lot of the marketing uh gurus for a while and uh um yeah the ai discussion is really interesting i've seen more of that now where uh people are using it to publish stuff um so I, I appreciate um going to look into that the Travis app and some other stuff. Um, but yeah, you mentioned you mentioned ClickFunnel Live. Um, I, I was following ClickFunnels for a while, um, but then I saw the uh, GrooveFunnels, and then <laughs> I took that. Bait. All the funnels are the same. Look, Mike's a friend yeah. of mine. We like Russell Brunson. We're all friends. Yeah, yeah. The, it's I not figured. the tool, okay? You want to be a master carpenter? Do you really think whether you buy that hammer from Sears or whatever that the hammer is going to make the difference or it's actually having a blueprint and having the skill? Yeah. 
all the funnel building tools are the same thing, okay? You just have these leaders of these funnel tools that brew a different brand of Kool-Aid. So Mike feels same. Maybe he does, you know, great Kool-Aid and Russell Brunson does, you know, Hawaiian punch Kool-Aid. But they're all, they're all the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't, don't get caught up in the cult of personality around any particular set of tools. The personality and the content creation is separate from the tool. tool. Just because you really like Russell Brunson doesn't mean ClickFunnels necessarily is great software or vice versa. There's a bunch of software we use that is that doesn't have a Russell Brunson, you know, Jonestown Kool-Aid drinking leader, but is actually better software, but you never heard of it. Like Mendasta, they don't, they don't have a Russell Brunson but their software beats the pants off these other people. Or if you're running an agency, you're doing white label stuff, go high levels, fantastic. But Sean Clark is not as prominent as these other people, but his software is ridiculous. Hmm. So look okay. at what the tools actually do. Don't, don't get caught up in the brand of the founder, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, but do you think uh, GrooveFunnels has more capability than the ClickFunnels? Or? They're, they're all in one, business in a box, every kind of funnel. I mean, if you want the one that has the most, it's going to be the, um, shoot. You know what? I don't want to go into that, that rat hole discussion sure. because okay. there's 15 yeah. or 20 other tools that all kind of overlap. <laughs> Look, that, that it's become the, the funnel building stuff. They've all become commodities. Okay. I wouldn't even yeah. worry about it. Okay. The, the best funnel is you. <laughs> it's you on video. That's why I like, I like the go Tolstoy.com, which we can talk about in another session. The best funnel is you on video, not, buttons and landing pages and VSLs and all. it's it's not those components it's you face to face closing somebody okay yeah okay I love video yeah, love being on yeah. Video. awesome cool well, I'm glad you're here Rex we're about out of time but I'd love to say hi I'd love to hear from Sophie Aisha is it Charnay I'd love to hear from you guys because you guys have been waiting Yes, hi, thank you. This is very nice uh, course for me to listen to. So um, thank you, Dennis, for sharing the information about marketing. I am an accountant, so I'm a CPA, and I'm good at doing things, but I'm not good at marketing. So um, the, all the things about the social media, and um, I feel I'm really back uh, behind. So would love to hear... Um, more about your course and how things should be done, um, especially for what I'm doing. So I feel many times I feel sad because I can save clients lots of tax, but I don't know how to promote this. So that is something that I need to learn because I think accounting, I don't know how to shoot videos about accounting, about tax returns. And this is really some um, big question for me. Thank you for having me here. Sophie, I'm glad you're here. You know what's really cool is saving people a lot of money on their taxes. That's a very sexy topic. You might think like tax and accounting is a boring sort of thing, but when it comes to paying less taxes or you know avoiding tax audits and you know not doing things that are illegal, I think you're going to find that just talking about that, even if English is not your first language or you're not as entertaining as some of these other people, like Danny, Lisa, and Jeffrey are basically professional public speakers. Almost nobody's going to be able to talk at their level as clearly. So don't worry about that. I want you to follow Welton Hong, who has an agency for funeral homes, and he's out there making one-minute videos consistently. It has significantly grown his business. And I want you to look at Rachel Michalowski, who runs Tax Empire Accounting, and it's the same as what you're doing. And she's grown her business by putting her brand out there and giving tips and talking about her clients and different situations to avoid and just being very helpful. You can do the exact same thing. If you want to join our program, like Thomas talked about, it's called Office Hours Message Me, and I'll give you a link to it. It's $100 a month, and I think you'll do really well. But the key is you have to follow up. If you follow through with these exercises we give you, it's going to help you because most accountants suck. Most people at taxes, they suck. And so you're really competing against them and H and R Block. So you ought to be able to just blow them out of the water. And one one tip, uh, if I can add, Dennis, a quick tip: if you're struggling for what to record, what videos to make, what content to to make, in your in your profession, think about what are the questions that your clients 
typically ask you. You probably get asked the same question again and again and again when someone's asking about their taxes or preparing their receipts or whatever. So think about the questions you're commonly asked and just record a short video of the answer to that question. Because if your clients are asking that question, other people are thinking about the same thing. Fantastic. Hey, Lisa, Dan, do you want to add something for Sophie? Sophie, I think that you are on the right track. And I think, like Dennis said, I, you know, if you sign up for his office hours, then, you know, we can all work together, but you have to be ready to dedicate and, and show up. Um, and I 100% agree that the video is the best funnel. So just do short videos and FAQs and you're doing your, your own publicity and marketing. I think um, follow through that is a, the thing is I thought about marketing, but I'm so um, occupied with tons of returns. So guys, how do I get uh, my time out, get my hand out from this <laughs> um, uh, piles of works that that's so since I don't have time to do marketing. What's I have a great question? quote for you. Sophie, it's a one-liner that actually, Jeffrey, we were in the burnout session where I wrote this down. I don't know who said it, but it was delegate responsibility versus tasks. Mm. That was Colin. Colin Campbell said that. He says it often. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, Nisa, and Dennis. This gave me a um, good idea how to, how to move on to the next level. Sophie, I'd love to work with you. Love to see you grow. There's a lot of business owners and professionals like you who have this idea that marketing is this separate thing and they don't have time because they're busy. Let me tell you one little secret, which I'm sure Lisa and Jeffrey and Dan Danny will concur with. When you do, when you take care of your clients, when you're in the process of doing your business, that is your marketing because of word of mouth, because you're documenting what you're doing behind the scenes without revealing anything that's confidential, you know, this kind of thing. And so people connect with you because of who you are and just following you around and a, a day in the life of Sophie. It is not marketing is not some separate activity that you have to do. The separate activity is when you hire someone on Fiverr or you get a VA or whatever to handle those sorts of administrative editing, you know, building funnels. I don't really think anyone who is an entrepreneur or business owner should be messing around with funnels, right? We're all architects. I don't think the architect should be pouring concrete in the foundation or hammering nails into the roof, right? I guess you could if you really wanted to because you want to get real. But all of us should be focusing on our business and our relationships and our clients. And that's the 5% of the work where we really add the most value. And the 95% delegate that stuff out. Do you think I want to do the taxes for our company? Heck no, I'm delegating that out. Mm. But we're creating the content. That's the key thing. You create the content. You do that, you'll win. Most people don't. Don't even do that. Look at your competitors. Do a Google search, right, in your city for tax preparation and accounting and whatever. How many of these folks are making video? Almost none. You're going to win. Yeah, yeah. I'm writing down the uh, what you're saying and I'm going to follow up. Thanks, Thank you, Sophie. Sophie. All right. Aisha, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I really have been enjoying the conversation. I've gotten a lot of value from it. Um, I didn't get to write everything down, so I made sure to follow everyone so I can stay in contact. Um, but for me, I am kind of like the opposite. I actually am very passionate about content. I've been doing film and video for, since I was in high school, and now I'm an audio video high school teacher. And um, just recently over the summer, I dwelled into starting to do content consulting for entrepreneurs. And I also envision myself doing this whole content consulting for teachers because during the pandemic, I learned how online education is just like, you know, so valuable. So the whole courses, the podcast is all of my, in my alley of pursuit or my passion, but I haven't actually put myself out there. And I think um, what I had been thinking is ho what's holding me back is, um, well, I don't know where to start. What actually should be the first topic I decide to do my own video on? And um, I just took in answering um, the previous question, Sophie's question, um, where you guys said pretty much just um, record a video of what frequently asked questions. I guess I can start there. Um, but. Do you just have any advice for it's like, I feel like I have all of the 
or where to start, particularly for me being an audio video teacher, what could be the first type of content I can put out to streamline everything else? Because I think when I like figure out, like get the, put it all together, like put the key into the lock, everything else will uh, it'll trickle down and I'll be able to create a whole legacy of being an online course consultant like you all in some degree. Uh, but for me personally, I'm trying to figure out where should I start? Well, I'm glad you're here, Aisha. I'd love to hear from our other moderators here what advice they have for her. Because it's a cobbler has no shoes situation, right? Very common with consultants. Yes, I agree. One of the um, ideas that first came to mind it, it, is I like to talk about trends. And so I'm sure that that's something that would just come naturally to you to talk about what's trending in, in your your space in your industry, because that's what everybody wants to know. So I would do a blend of maybe what's trending, but then also um, content that's evergreen, which means that it'll never, you know, it'll never be outdated or anything. So finding a balance to that. But I, I really think the FAQ idea is, is, a, is the best way to start, because that will po possibly be like each frequently asked question could be a, a chapter or a module. I was just going to mention, I'm sure if Jeff should give Aisha the instructions on joining startup.club so she can go listen to this uh, this session after the show to pick up the things that she missed. Yeah, thanks for that, Thomas. I'll just remind everyone that we are recording this show, and you can find the recording over at startup.club. That's the website for Startup Club. So you can um, listen to the show again. And we're trying to put together better show notes, too. So hopefully the team will pick out. You'll be able to he see the transcript as well. But we'll also try to pick out some of the links and things that were mentioned here tonight to make it easier to find those resources. But you can find all the recordings of the Coach U Show over at Startup.Club. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you. And thank you, Jeffrey, and our Startup.Club friends for putting all this together. Aisha, there's another session recorded on personal branding that I think will be great for you and starting out and telling your story and having content. And there's another session we did on networking. So when you amplify and, and honor your mentors and the other people in the industry that you work with, your clients, you're gonna find that that naturally will drive direction for you. And moving from working on clients to working on yourself and treating yourself as a first class client, just like the other clients, you're going to see a significant increase in your business because people are going to know who you are. So I'm so glad you're here, Aisha. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Last but not least, is it Charnay Tunson? How are yes. you doing? Patiently I'm waiting. good. How are you? Oh, so thank you guys so much. Um, I just wanted to quickly hop on here and just say um, thank you for this information. I got a lot of value out of it. And um, in just listening to what you guys were sharing, I took a peek at the Descript app and I'm um, just pulled in a video that I did uh, last week and it already transcribed it for me and now I'm getting ready to just edit it and turn that video into um, an ebook so I really appreciate that information that nugget that you guys dropped and um, I teach online classes so uh, a lot of what Aisha is aspiring to do is what I did I'm a former a school principal and when COVID hit and we had to shut our school down um, I needed to create a, a platform for my teachers so that I could get them up to speed and quickly found that that was a huge market. Um, there was a need there because most teachers are used to being face-to-face -face and not developing their online classes. And so I kind of got to a place where I was stuck just a little bit. Um, but this information that you guys shared today has really um, got my wheels turning. And so I just wanted to just give you a, a verbal thank you and um Looking forward, I follow you. I'm following you now. I'm looking forward to getting some more great information. So you guys can do it. Take the information. Don't just write it down in your notebook, but actually act on it. I mean, in the time that this session has gone, I've already um, uploaded a video, received the transcription, and now I'm just going to go through and edit the text, throw in some images, and I'll probably have an ebook ready by tomorrow. So this wow. could be your first piece of content. This story right here that you just how you just did this. That could be your first piece of content that you create. Incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. I'm so proud of you. That is so cool. See how she took action. You could, if you really wanted to get the A plus extra credit, because you're the edupreneur school principal, you can make a one minute video 
or 15 second video, whatever you choose about what you just learned here and about startup.club and how everyone here is sharing, or maybe just one tip, right? A 15 second tip. But if you do, if you do these videos, the videos are the ones that you can transcribe and you being an educator, Lisa being an educator, all of us were, all marketers are now educators. All entrepreneurs are educators. It starts with video. It starts with literally showing from your direct example, what you did. Like, Hey, I was in the coach you show. I learned about how to use a transcription video editing tool and I produced an ebook the next day. Here it is. Check it out. Wow. That's awesome. That's a great story. And along it's the done. way too, don't it's, even wait for the done. final product. <laughs> yeah, it no, it's yeah, done. Can... It'll be done. <laughs> Boom. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sharnay. You guys are amazing. I love hanging out with you guys every week. Sharnay, can I ask you maybe pop in one of, you know, next week and share with us what's happened with your ebook, right? When you shared it, how many people read it or what people thought you mean you put it on twitter and facebook and youtube what was the reaction I'd love to hear and other content you're producing i'd love to hear about your journey come share next week or I, the week after i will do so thanks for the invitation you rock all right jeffrey close us out my friend all right well thank you dennis thank you lisa thomas murgesh rex sophie charnay everyone who joined us on stage earlier uh, and everyone who's in the audience listening, this has been another great edition of the Coach You Show. Um, great to hear that um, those of you who came up and thanked us are getting value from the tips and stories we're sharing. And that's really what's great. And I'll mention, you know, you're, if you're thinking about how can you get your recordings, Clubhouse is a great platform. You know, we started doing these rooms on Startup Club and we were not recording them in the very beginning. And then, duh, the light bulb went off and we realized, hey, this is great content. We don't want it to just disappear. Um, so let's start recording these. Let's turn them into blog posts. Let's turn them into po podcasts. And let's repurpose this content. So we're doing right here on Clubhouse everything we just talked about right here on Clubhouse. So thank you, Dennis. This has been the Coach You Show. As Dennis mentioned, the Coach You Show is every Thursday evening at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, you can find recordings of the shows over at startup.club. That's the website for Startup Club. Sign up for our mailing list to stay informed. And thank you again for spending an hour or so with us this evening. You guys are awesome.